Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm David Whitman, the president of Hamilton College. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you tonight, and a special welcome to the parents and alumni who are joining us by Facebook. The idea for this evening's program actually came from our two speakers. David Solomon and Thomas Tull see every day the impact of technology on innovation, entrepreneurship, business, and society, and they offered to talk with us about it. Mostly, they wanted to talk about it with our students, both in the classroom and outside of it, and that is what they've been doing since arriving here earlier today. Now, David and Thomas both have a fair number of similarities. Both are Hamilton alumni, both are parents of Hamilton graduates, and both are members of the Board of Trustees. They're also both CEOs of major U.S. companies. David heads Goldman Sachs, the multinational investment bank headquartered in New York City, and Thomas founded and heads Tulco, a Pittsburgh-based investment holding company. He also founded and headed Legendary Entertainment before selling that company in 2016. In typical liberal arts fashion, both David and Thomas prepared for their careers in business by majoring in government. Both have a day job, but nonetheless, both give generously of their time to causes that are important to them. Naturally, both are major supporters of Hamilton, and for that, we are deeply grateful. David is also on the board of the Robin Hood Foundation, and Thomas sits on the boards of the National Baseball Hall of Fame, the National Football Foundation, and the Smithsonian. They both have some unusual side interests. David performs regularly as DJ Desaw, mixing electronic dance music for a live audience. And some of you had the privilege of hearing him in New York City in December. Thomas describes himself as a fanboy of comics, and he is an avid and experienced gamer. On behalf of Hamilton, it is my pleasure to welcome them both back to College Hill. We're also extraordinarily fortunate to have with us this evening Julia LaRoche, senior writer and on-air reporter for Yahoo Finance. She will be our moderator this evening. She studied broadcast journalism at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and her on-camera interviews include, among others, Starbucks Chairman Emeritus Howard Schultz, Blackstone CEO Stephen Schwartzman, Home Depot co-founder Ken Langone, and David Solomon's predecessor at Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein. Like David and Thomas, Julia also has an unusual side interest. She competed on the UNC equestrian team and is currently a member of the New York City Parks Enforcement Patrol Mounted Auxiliary. Please join me in welcoming David Solomon, Thomas Tall, and Julia LaRoche. Thank you so much for having us. It's such a pleasure to be here with Thomas and David. So let's go back to the beginning. I want to start how and why did you choose Hamilton? And when you were at Hamilton, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? I want to hear about your path. So uh, let's start with you. Uh, well, I was fortunate to get into a school like this, that's for sure. And I think it was basically the weather that uh, attracted me <laughs> to campus. Um, but uh, no, it's an amazing place that frankly changed my life. And you know, I was the first one in my family to go to college, and uh, this place, you know, had an enormous impact on me, and, and continues to. So it's very special to be back here today. And David, I didn't get into Williams. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I I wanted I wanted to go to a small school, and um, my parents had gone to school, you know, up in this area, Cornell. Um, but I had come out of a small high school, and I really wanted to go to a small liberal arts college, and I. You know, I, uh, I was very fortunate to get in here and kind of arrived here, and I'm just so glad that, uh, that, that I spent my four years here, and I've obviously, you know, along with Thomas, have been involved for a long time, uh, and just really look at the experience I had here as being super, super formative, you know, for me in so many, so many positive ways. And so it's always great to be back here. Now, Thomas, did you have any idea your freshman year what you wanted to do when you graduated? Uh, there was, I, I thought I was going to be a lawyer, uh, for sure, and then as time went on, uh, that became clear that that wasn't the right path. And probably in my early 20s, I realized that I was unemployable. Um, it would have worked out poorly for both sides, so decided that, you know, I always wanted to have 
my own business, so that was important to me. But uh, in terms of did I haunt the uh, campus here and know what the roadmap looked like? Absolutely not. So for any of you students that are either seniors or juniors or you don't know what that looks like, relax. No, pretty much nobody does, and you'll be fine. And David, was there something that you studied at Hamilton that you found helped you um, preparing for Wall Street? And, and what was your story? How did you, how did you get to Wall Street? Um, well, like like Thomas, I didn't I didn't really know you know what I wanted to do coming out of college, and the, the world's the world's changed a lot because I you know I talked to students today. The students that that I found that we spoke to today, you know, on the Hill were just incredibly engaged, you know, really thinking about uh, things that candidly I'm not sure that I was thinking about or focusing on when when you know was when I was on the Hill. You know, the whole process we really didn't start thinking about what we wanted to do when we graduated until we were seniors. And then it was a process of writing to lots of different companies and saying, you know, hey, do you have entry level jobs? Can we have a job? And I was, I was relatively unfocused, but I knew that I wanted to go to New York City. Um, and at the time, you know, finance was, this was in the early 80s, finance was really starting to expand and so there were a lot of job opportunities and I interviewed at a, you know, at a variety of places and I got a, a couple of offers and I decided to go into one of these training programs um, at a commercial bank and I, I did not know I did not know a lot about finance. I was a government major. I studied American history, um, and, um, and took a lot of writing, you know, up here. And uh, and it was it was a new path. But I, I got I got attracted to it relatively quickly for a variety of reasons. And and it's been a, it's been a good path for me. But very different from Thomas. I've had a very traditional career of kind of working for companies and working my way up. You know, Thomas has been you know, came out of Hamilton and really has been an entrepreneur and has created a lot of things from scratch. And so just very, very different paths for two different people who are government majors at Hamilton College. The but, strength of a liberal arts education. But it worked out okay. It's, it's worked out okay. It's worked out okay for both of us, two different paths. I, I would definitely say that it worked great for both of you. Um, what, what I learned today was just you're, you're talking about your experience at Hamilton and specifically as it relates to technology and connecting with friends. I thought that was really fun. So go back to, for you, go back to 1992. What was tech like for you on campus? Uh, I think there was an abacus. <laughs> um, there were, you know, there were some people had computers in their rooms, but I mean, certainly nothing, not, not even remotely close to what exists today. So, um, you know, nothing to speak of. I mean, we talked about this, we talked about this in one of the classes today. You know, being at Hamilton, you know, technology in the early 1980s, technology was a telephone. I mean, a landline rotary dial telephone. And um, you didn't have one. You had to be very, very privileged to have one. So generally, you know, your parents called on the pay phone that existed in the hall and, you know, somebody would pick it up and they'd, you know, run down the hall and yell, David, your parents are on the phone. And that was, you know, that was kind of technology. Uh, there were no computers. I typed my papers on a typewriter or I paid somebody a dollar a page to type my papers. Um, it, um, you know, it was a very different experience. And I, you know, I, I remember vividly, I was working you know, at the Irving Trust Company, the first time I had an experience with a with a computer, with a personal computer, um, that was that was a real, you know, experience the way you'd think about it today. There were obviously in the late seventies, you know, there were there were the beginnings of personal computers that were out, but really with not, you know, real functionality. Then, um, just in your careers, uh, when it comes to technology, what was that aha moment for you? when you realize you could use technology, whether it's an investment or um, just in general, what was that for you? I'd say it was kind of a combination of doing a lot of tech investing in the latter half of the 90s and seeing uh, the power of what, what, what could happen. I was uh, living at the time in Research Triangle Park uh, at, a, at a tech venture fund and watched some amazing things happen. And then I think, um, you know, being at Legendary and starting the analytics division and getting just a you know, material impact across uh, the way we spent our advertising money to concept testing and all kinds of things that you would not have traditionally thought about uh, in terms of a media company. Um, so that, that had a, a big impact certainly on what I'm, what I'm doing today. But those are, I think, a couple of highlights. 
I think that's actually really interesting. You just mentioned the media industry, which is massive. But if you kind of narrowed that down to film, how, how do you see that um, the techno technology impacting that going forward? Well, I, I would say a couple things. Obviously, the storytelling aspect, you're able to do things now that were impossible not all that long ago. Um, and I also think that the way in which audiences are interacting uh, with content and storytelling is very, very different. I think the barrier to decide to go out uh, at a given place at a given time, a, a theater, and watch a movie at an appointed time, that it's not that people don't do it, but the barrier is higher. And when you think about uh, being able to log on to Netflix or HBO Go or Hulu, um, there's an enormous amount of content that is at your fingertips that has pretty big implications uh, for how you decide to spend your time and money and attention. And David, we're also seeing technologies disrupting the financial services business. You've been in this industry for 35 years. Um, how do you see that impacting the way you run your firm? Well, I think it's, I think that technology disruption and change from technology in our business has been something that's been an ongoing process over a long period of time. You can go back to 35 years ago when I started, and, and if somebody wanted to trade a stock, the whole process of doing it was an analog process. You know, person to person to person to person, handwritten tickets that were ultimately, uh, you know, orchestrated or accounted for, you know, at the end of the day. Obviously, the business of trading stocks now is done on a technology platform. It's completely automated. To win in that business, you need a massive investment in that platform. You need very, very low, you know, cost per trade, low cost, low, low transaction cost, low friction, uh, high quality execution. And so that's, you know, it's a great example of a technology platform and really a business that's been involved over 25 years. You know, I think looking today, the big place where there's going to be really significant disruption around financial services is the way we all as individuals deal with financial institutions and deal with our financial affairs. And the ability to have your financial affairs and financial wellness and information for you to manage all that in an integrated digital platform, which is very different than the experience of dealing with people and bank branches and the kind of disjointed approach between whether it's borrowing money, saving money, uh, protecting or insuring, investing, it's been relatively siloed. That's going to be a much more integrated digital experience. And I think the disruption is going to be significant. And I think there are going to be players that are going to be big legacy players in those businesses. And there'll be other business platforms that find ways to control the activity you know, in those businesses, too. And I think that that's going to be very significant in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Right, and you're seeing that in financial services. Uh, now, Thomas, you run Tolco. It takes a really interesting investment approach, and I would love for you to share that with the audience here. Um, especially, you go into companies or industries that are a bit more sleepy, mm -hmm. and you apply technology. Can you kind of t walk us through your investment thesis? Yeah, so Tolco is a holding company um, which gives us uh, long-term capital. It also gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in, in terms of how, how we approach um, the companies that we own, et cetera. But the, the basic thesis was to, in the, in the middle of Tulco, uh, we have Tulco Labs, which um, is a, a bunch of uh, PhDs in data science and uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. They'll wor work with our business analysts and we'll find sectors and then within those sectors, uh, management teams running companies that we think are really interesting uh, and ripe for innovation. So if we end up buying the company, labs will go in and fundamentally change uh, the way that they do business um, and hopefully fundamentally change the value proposition of the company. So. We're in everything from a security company, waste management, uh, we own a, a healthcare garment, uh, workwear company, um, getting into insurance. So it's a little bit different than uh, making the dark night, um, but I, I think it's incredibly interesting and you know, jump out of bed excited every morning. Yeah, but what's, what, one of the things that I think has been so special about you know, what you've done and what you've developed that you really took away from making The Dark Knight is you built an analytics business around the marketing of films and the distribution of films. And you really looked at data science as a way to better understand how you should spend and how you should market around movies, given the massive spend that's around. And you've really taken that 
you know, that analytic mindset, that data science mindset, and you're applying it to a broader array of businesses. And so, you know, I, I think it flows very nicely. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, that, was, that was one of the really innovative things you did, you know, at Legendary. Well, and, and look, if I can add one other thing that just about the power of the network of Hamilton and the community that you're a part of, you know, it had a big impact on me. First at, at Legendary, uh, because of Hamilton, I got to know A.G. Laffley, who I would argue is one of the best managers of the last 40 years, uh, running in Procter & Gamble. A.G. came on uh, my board of directors and provided incredibly uh, valuable insight at, at board meetings and beyond. And then when there were signs that I felt like, I think the business is changing and I think I'd like to sell my company, I had the opportunity to call David and ask for not only his advice, but he flew in, met with, with myself and my board, and at the time was running investment banking at Goldman Sachs. That's a pretty you know, big thing to be able to do, and without Hamilton, I'm not sure either one would have happened. So you're plugged into a pretty great network. You know, we were talking about technology here today. We were going around to the different classrooms, and you are talking about topics like artificial intelligence, automation, all of these forces that are going to shape the labor force going forward. So I would just love to get your takes, because both of you are products of Hamilton, a liberal arts college. What is the value of a liberal arts degree, and how important is that going to be going forward? I mean, I'll, I'll start. You should, you should jump in. I, I, I'm a big advocate for, for a liberal arts education. It's not for everyone. We, we can't and won't have a society where everyone uh, gets a liberal arts education. However, there are certain aspects of it and certain aspects of it here at Hamilton that I think are incredibly powerful. You know, critical thinking and problem solving in business and in life are just hugely important skills. Uh, and to be able to, you know, experiment across a broad array of disciplines and really learn how to think about things um, has helped me, you know, massively as I've navigated my career. Hamilton also emphasizes communication skills in a big, big way, both public speaking skills, but also you know, writing skills. And I think about the importance of communication skills in any business or any kind of professional experience. Hugely important, and Hamilton had a profound impact you know, on me in that, uh, in that way. So when you know, I, I look at those things, I think, and I said this to you earlier, there are lots of paths to professional success. There are lots of different ways, different businesses, different industries, different things that you can do. Generally, you have to be smart enough, but you have to have really good EQ. You have to know how to communicate. You have to know how to solve problems. You have to be adaptable and flexible. Um, you have to be in a position to understand what's going on in the world around you. And a liberal arts education really teaches that. And I think it gives people that are lucky enough to go through that experience, you know, options you know, in life as their life unfolds uh, to do more, see more, experience more. And so I, I continue to be a huge advocate. We hire, obviously we hire lots of people with strong fundamental economic backgrounds, but we hire lots of liberal arts students, you know, too. And the liberal arts students compete very well, you know, in our, you know, finance business against people that are highly finance trained, especially over time. Hard to improve on that answer. So I, I, I completely agree with David, and I think in some ways it's becoming more valuable. And the only thing I, I would add is that as Hamilton thinks about its future and is looking to make sort of the digital transition and, and making uh, data fluency and, and so forth be part of the curriculum, I think that's a very wise choice. And I think it's a very powerful combination to have a thoughtful liberal arts education uh, with, with uh, being able to transverse and, and be fluid uh, with technology and, and um, digital, so to speak. All right, well, I would like to dig more in on tech, specifically um, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So Thomas, if you could unpack what that means for the crowd and then sort of the impact these forces will have on society. Well, there, there's certainly many different uh, definitions, but I think in terms of artificial intelligence, it's teaching a machine um, first with a set of rules, and then if it's good, it goes beyond that and starts to create its own. But helping us uh, solve problems, uh, being able to find 
uh, both anomalies and um, you know, looking across either data sets or uh, deciding everything from a practical standpoint on actuarial tables for insurance, certainly massive implications in the, in the uh, financial services um, and, and how we interact. Uh, and I think um, there are pretty big implications to come as, as things start to accelerate uh, because you're now seeing the two ingredients that you need, which is massive data sets and computing power in a place where you know, it's going to go from a lot of theory uh, and science fiction in, into more practical applications. What sort of implications? Um, I think there, there can be fairly profound implications. I think both in terms of the technology itself, how much more efficient uh, that, that we can be. Um, and I think in terms of society, you are going to have implications across what folks' jobs entail between person, machine, interface. I think there are going to be implications across policy writing and, and government. Um, business practices. I think we're put in a really interesting position with, with uh, China in terms of their rule sets versus ours and the competitiveness and the race to be the, uh, you know, the world's leader in artificial intelligence. And then socially, I think there are all kinds of implications. So, um, you know, I, I certainly think there are and we, we think about this every day, there are massive jumps in productivity and other things, but there are certainly going to be splashes that are made from that that are, you know, and some of which I don't even think we've thought about yet. David, how are you thinking about this? Well, there's, I mean, there's no question the forces Thomas is talking about are, are real, and the pace of change in, in some ways is accelerating. Uh, you're going to see and you're going to hear, you know, lots of debate around the effects that it has on labor force, job opportunities, you know, how society functions. You know, I'm of a belief that the, the change in the way machines and automation can participate or perform certain tasks will accelerate. Um, but I'm not as sure that, you know, the impact, you know, on labor force will be as dramatic um, as some, you know, as some speculate. I think we create new platforms, new opportunities, and we create, therefore, new jobs that come out of that at the same point I think people are going to need different skills, different training, different evolution, you know, to really be productive in a society where, where more of that is the case. And look, I see it in our business very directly. Things that used to be done, you know, with people are done with machines. Um, and even, you know, even in a more specific way, uh, you know, we have a business that trades bonds, and we have a number of traders that are human beings that set prices. They tend to put prices into machines and are connected to clients by machines, maybe sometimes because that's an over-the-counter business. They'll do prices on an analog store or voice-to-voice -voice basis. But we now have a machine that actually makes markets you know, in 15,000 different bonds. And it makes them very effectively with the data it can plug into. And so you know, that's, a, you know, that's a very, very you know, fine example of something a handful of years ago it would be hard to imagine that actually works quite effectively today in our business. But there are also great opportunities you know, out of the data and the information and the ability for the technology to continue to progress, to give people better tools, better information sources, to make better decisions. Um, and so all of that's also, you know, pretty exciting. And that's stuff that we're spending a lot of time thinking about and we think is pretty exciting. So how do you guys sort of balance the two? Uh, you have the benefits, the productivity, and then you have the concern over the job loss. How do you balance that? Well, I think, I think we can't, you can't, um, it's great to predict and it's great to prognosticate about where the world's going, but we have to function in the world and we have to adapt, you know, as the world changes. And I, you know, I think you have to be clear that the amount of change in the world has been enormous, you know, over the course of my time to Hamilton to now. I mean, just think about the implications of the cell phone um, and the smartphone. And it's basically, we've, we've gone from a point when I graduated from Hamilton that I hadn't really worked on a computer ever to the point that we have billions of people walking around with a computer in their hand. And so that's had a profound you know, impact on our society and there are benefits and there are drawbacks to that, but we've gotten more comfortable with both the benefits and the drawbacks you know, as, as we've evolved. I think at the end of the day, there are 
you know, pillars of our society that can participate in helping us work through this. You've got government, you've got businesses, you know, broadly big and small businesses, you've got educational institutions, you know, universities and, and educational institutions, and, you know, all of those have to participate in making an investment in helping us navigate the future as the world continues to change. And we've, we've managed to do it successfully in the past. That doesn't mean it's a guarantee we'll do it successfully in the future. Um, but we're all going to have to continue to adapt. You can't go backwards. Um, and I think when you hear people talking about going backwards, they're, they're losing the plot. You have to go mm -hmm. forward, and you, you know, progress, you know, progress sometimes is difficult. But I've got a lot of confidence that we'll find ways as a society to navigate it. That leads me to my next question. Uh, we're talking about investing in this. Is the United States doing enough when it comes to preparing or investing in artificial intelligence? Because in some ways, it almost feels like a space race, if you will, when you think of AI and what China's doing. Do you think we're doing enough? And what can be done uh, to further that? Um, I think we're starting to wake up to it. And I think we're starting to stir. And the United States has an outstanding track record of when we you know, put our mind to something as a country. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to be pretty focused on because uh, the, the, the race, we talked about this in the econ class, but you know, the, the trade war thing is not nearly as important as the tech side of it and the competition that's going on between China and the United States. So, you know, you've seen Steve Schwartzman just gave $350 million to MIT to spark, uh, you know, some, some work and, and some thought around AI and um, was with him recently and heard his thoughts. And so I, I would say we're, we're starting to wake up, but um, I, I still think we need to be doing more. You know, it's, 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 and I think you interviewed Steve, you know, when, right. when, that was all, when that was all announced, but one of the things that Steve talked about, which I just think is a great example, and it, it you know, it resonates with what Thomas said, when we put our mind to something, you know, as, when the United States puts its mind to something, we really make progress. You know, you think back, and Steve mentioned this, you think back to when in the early 60s we decided we wanted to put someone on the moon. Think about the investment that we made toward that goal. And the result wasn't just that we put somebody on the moon. The result was all the technology that was developed out of the investment to achieve that goal. And so I do think if I go back to what I said a few minutes ago, you know, government, business, educational institutions have to work together to make sure we're making the right investments, you know, to capitalize on this and continue to position, you know, the United States in a very, very positive way from a competitive perspective. And we have a very big competitor, you know, that sits on the other side of the world. Um, you know, a lot of CEOs, um, I can think of Elon Musk, for example, uh, Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg, have all brought up that because of autom automation, artificial intelligence, the resulting job displacement, that we will need universal basic income. What are your thoughts on universal basic income? Well, I'm, I'm surprised that they're so sure. So I know that they're sure. I'm not as sure as they are. And so I... Um, I think, look, I think it's very important that, that businesses, government, that all of us work in contributing to make sure that there's opportunity you know, for people in, this, in our communities, in this country, you know, broadly. And actually, I think it's an issue that deserves a lot more attention, a lot more focus. You know, wealth disparity you know, in this country is a real issue. It's going to get a lot more attention and a lot more debate. It's a big jump from where we are today to make assumptions that society is going to look fundamentally different. You know, I, I, I think we all have responsibility to create opportunity and make sure this is a country that continues to provide opportunity for everyone. It doesn't always do that. But, you know, switching to a different system and to working out how to operate and being so sure today that that's where we're headed, I, I wouldn't say that. And so I don't want to speculate on what that would look like or whether or not it's a good thing because I don't, I don't, I don't see it as a likely thing that, that, uh, that we'll be wrestling with in the near term. Um, a couple of things. I, I think that job displacement is potentially a real thing, and I think it'll happen slower than everybody thinks, and then faster. Um, I, I do think there are certain sectors that will have to reimagine their skill sets, and I think we have to think about what training is offered. Um, there's certainly a lot of talk about 
national income, to, to David's point, I think we're a long way away from that being a, a real versus theoretical conversation. And I would hope, because I think there are a lot of implications if you take that path that are, you know, fundamentally different than what the country was, was uh, built on. But, you know, I think over time, if, uh, if we do have large worker displacements, there's going to be all kinds of conversations. But I, I agree with David. It's very hard to sit here with what you know today and say, well, I think this is exactly what's going to happen. You mentioned certain sectors might be more vulnerable to the displacement. Which ones are on your radar? What, what are you thinking about? Well, I think c certainly just watching what's happening in the retail sector and physical locations, uh, looking at transportation, how goods and services are, are moved around physically, uh, whether that's trucking or other things. Um, so I, I think those are pretty big categories and, and things to keep an eye on. You know, a lot of companies are emphasizing this idea of resilience. What does that term mean to you, and how do you foster that in your own lives? Well, I think, I think, um, I think companies need to be resilient, you know, to survive over any sustainable period of time. You know, one of the things we're very proud of and very excited about at Goldman Sachs this year is that it's our 150th anniversary. And the um, 150th anniversary basically is Goldman Sachs. And there are very, very few companies that make it for 150 years. You make it for 150 years because when there's adversity, you find a way to adapt and adjust and be resilient. And you find a way to evolve your business. And you find a way to continue, even in the face of change that comes in different forms or comes in technology disruption, to deliver a product or a service to your clients or your customers that they really value. And if you, if you don't do that, you don't do that really well, you know, over time, you know, your business becomes, becomes more challenged. I think whether you're talking about a business or you're talking about for any of us individually, life is not easy. Life throws all of us challenges and you have to, you know, you have to be resilient to, uh, to navigate through. And I think it's a very, very valuable skill. When we, when we interview people at Goldman Sachs, one of the things we look for is resiliency. Um, and I think that, that people that show an ability to deal with adversity, because no matter what, in your professional life and your personal life, everybody has it. People that show an ability to deal with it and to deal with it in a human way, to deal with it empathetically when they're working with others who are going through it, you know, that stuff, that stuff really matters. And so I think it's something that leaders and organizations have to be really attuned to. How do you think about the concept of resiliency? I think it's enormously important, and one of the most important characteristics both a company or an individual um, can exhibit. And you know, to me, that goes hand in hand with uh, your culture in your company. And to me, culture trumps business plan because I guarantee your business plan is going to morph and change and go in directions that you you didn't anticipate. Um, but if you have the right culture at your company, and if you are resilient and show grit, you're a lot more uh, you're a lot more likely to survive and and grow than just sort of standing on the railroad track saying, "My plan didn't say this, so I'm not sure uh, what we can what we can do here." And I think, again, I constantly think about just the velocity of change, so I think those characteristics became become even more important. Uh, is, is things seem to be a lot more elastic these days. Whether you're running a small business or a big business, business is just constantly changing. Right. It's constantly under pressure. There are very few people that are lucky enough to run a business that just kind of works the same way for an extended period of time. And so you have to adapt. You have to always be looking around corners. You have to be thinking about how your business is going to evolve and how it's going to be different, how you can continue to add value. Um, and that's super important. Um, and so not, not easy things to do, but, uh, but people that get that right you know, have a tendency on a relative basis to perform better over an extended period of time. Well, speaking of disruptors, there are a few names um, in the tech world right now, big tech companies that are under scrutiny for some of their business practices. Some people refer to this as the so-called tech lash, the backlash against tech. Um, do you think the criticism of these companies is valid? 
Well, it would depend on okay, the circumstances. I mean, it, it's Facebook, <coughs> it's, it's Google, it's Amazon, the, the obvious names that are being criticized right now. Do you want to go first? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go first. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Look, you know, these companies, these are hugely successful companies that, that to the point, have added a lot of value and have also been disruptive in creating different business paradigms you know, to operate in. As they've, as they've done that, they've gotten to be very large, very successful companies. And you know, a number of them are operating in ways that are different than companies that touch the businesses that A Impact have operated before. Whenever that happens, if you look back historically, we've had a tendency as a society to want to put rules or parameters or guardrails around how those evolving businesses operate. And we're in the process of debating that and doing that you know, for some of these businesses. And so I think it's appropriate that you know, society, government takes a look and says, you know, what's best you know, broadly for our society, what's best for consumers. And you know, that's stuff that's getting a lot, of, a lot of attention. When companies do things that have implication for their customers, uh, their users, et cetera, they're responsible, and you know they own that responsibility. We all do. You know, Goldman Sachs is far from perfect, and we've we've had issues and mistakes that have been made, you know, in our organization, and we own that. We're responsible for that. And so, you know, if you want to run a big company and you want to have a big footprint and a big impact, you know, you own the good and the bad, and it's your job to you know evolve appropriately. You know, when things go wrong. Now, I think one of the things that has to be understood is when you run big, complicated companies, things go wrong. And that doesn't mean that you can't, you can't make them better, you can't pivot, you can't improve. And I think you've always got to be very self-reflective and very focused on self-improvement when you run a big company because there are always going to be issues. And so I think this is a natural product of the fact that these companies have grown very fast and they have a big, they have a, they have a big footprint and a big impact. I think they're doing some things that are very, very positive, and I think they're doing some things that will evolve in different ways as, as you know, we as a society decide what those guardrails or rules should be. Yeah, I think you know, the, for the first thing is, again, there's, real, there's no roadmap for this. No one's ever run companies of this ilk before. So I think they have to examine what, what they stand for, what their own rules are. Certainly government is going to step in and, and the scrutiny is going to be there. But the bigger you get and the more complex uh, your company is, I think you, you have to have those guiding principles. And when you start to go outside them, that's when you can get into trouble. So I would say, not hedging, but and I know a lot of folks, as David does at, at these, these companies. Um, so I think that they are extremely valuable and do a lot of good. And I think with that, you know, not to quote Marvel and Spider-Man, but with that, <laughs> that, you know, with that power comes responsibility, and we're going to see how that, how that evolves. I also think one of the things, Julia, that's, that's evolved with this is they are very big companies, but I think one of the things that's important to put into context, if you go back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you look at the, mar the largest company you know, in the United States in any of those time periods, it's its percentage of the overall market cap of US public companies is no different today right. than where we are. So it's tended to be kind of six, seven, eight, but the largest company in the world, whether you know, in the past it was GE at one point or it was, it was Exxon you know, at one point. And it tends to be six, seven, eight percent you know, of US market cap. And that's, you know, that's exactly where we are you know, with the one or two of these companies that are you know, of that size. So they are big, but they're not different big in the context of the way the economy's expanded and the world's expanded. That said, they've really disrupted businesses and some of the fundamental principles about the way we've thought about competitiveness or anti-competitiveness are being challenged because anti-competitiveness has always you know, talked about uh, a principle of how is the consumer benefiting. That's being challenged. And I think issues around data and privacy and information, those are serious issues that society's you know, really now appropriately starting to wrestle with. Yeah, those are definitely issues that um, a lot of folks have concerns about. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren came out with a blog post saying that she wanted to break up Facebook, Amazon, and Google, and she called them monopolies that, quote, hurt small businesses and in innovation. Do you think they hurt small businesses and in innovation? 
I think, I, think, I think innovation and small businesses are alive and well in the United States. I don't agree with Senator Warren's statement that these companies just should be broken up for, uh, for the sake of let's break up all these companies. Um, there is no question that in, in, in certain spaces where they've managed to create a very, very strong position. So if you look, if you look at social media, which is really, uh, as a business penetrating the advertising market, you know, obviously Facebook has a very, very strong position. And so for competitors, you know, in that space, I think that dynamic's changed. And that gets to that gets to one of the issues that we were talking about is how is the how is the regulatory environment going to look at competitiveness in this? But the solution is not to make blanket statements um, and you know take a large number of companies all the same and say this is what should happen. No, I don't I don't agree with that. And I think one of the things we should be very proud of here in the United States is that the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship and new business creation is alive and well, and it's actually one of the things that's fueling a lot of employment growth. So with all we're talking about where technology is creating change, it's all this new business creation, and the fact that that's something we really have right here in the United States is really helping us. And so I, I, I don't agree with the statement. What about the risk of cyber? That's something that Fed Chair Jay Powell cited recently in a 60 Minutes interview um, as one of the risks that he's focused on and worried about is cyber. How real or how, how worried should we be about cyber? I, I think uh, we should be. Our critical infrastructure is attacked every single day. And one of the things that I hope that our government does soon is to write a cyber doctrine we, we have rules of engagement that our, our friends and adversaries know how we're going to act, whether that's in uh, naval engagements or, um, you know, you make if-then statements. If you do this, then you can expect us to do that. We haven't done that yet uh, with the cyber doctrine to let people know, hey, if you attack us in this manner, we're going to respond in kind. And I think that's an important step. But uh, this is something that's, uh, that's here to stay and I think is a, a legitimate problem. I think when you, when you, when you think about, you, you think broadly across you know, big infrastructure parts of our economy, so transportation, um, you know, infrastructure power, uh, financial services, um, you know, everybody's vulnerable. Um, but I think that we have to worry about, and I think there are a lot of people, the good news is I think there are a lot of people that are worried about it, but there's still a lot more focus that's needed. Um, you know, there's vulnerability, you know, in all this, and it's something that we're going to have to wrestle with. You know, when we hear about data breaches or, or privacy breaches, there sometimes is this, you know, backlash from customers who are upset with the uh, various companies. Just broadly, how do you think is, what's the best way to regain trust when trust is broken, whether it's, um, you know, a hack or a breach? Yeah, it's, it's very, you know, it's very, um, it's very complicated things. And, and one of the, it's a very complicated thing, you know, when trust is broken to regain it. And there's a lot of companies that you can look back at in all sorts of ways, not just what you're talking about with data, et cetera, where trust is broken. But the you know, the path, to, the path to fixing it when a company has an issue that in some way, shape, or form affects trust is, it's a little bit of what Thomas said, you know, with power comes responsibility. You have to own it. Yes. And you have to recognize and own, you know, the fact that it happened. And you have to therefore go out and rebuild it, re-earn it. And so you have to mitigate. You have to show what you've done, you know, to improve and that you deserve over time an improvement in that trust. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a fragile thing. And so one of the things that we all wrestle with when you run these big businesses is that you build a reputation over a long period of time and it takes one person, one person's bad behavior to materially damage your reputation and affect the trust that your customers, your clients, the communities, you know, have. And so it's, you know, when it's broken, you, you have to own it and you have to work hard to build it back. And it's, uh, it's, it's not always an easy process. And I think that's an important point that that's one of the things that technology allows for. It's easier to break stuff, right? When you were not all that long ago to hurt a company would have taken a pretty systemic, sustained, physical, you know, there, there weren't these points of failure that could be one person saying, look, I'm, I'm going to take our database or I'm going to open a back door. And so that, that increases the vulnerability. Uh, and I think to David's point, 
if you are a company that something has happened and you've, you've lost that trust basis, transparency, completely taking ownership of it and, and then having a, a plan as to what you're going to do about it, I, I think is the only way forward. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, it's this, this issue of, you know, data and information, people breaking into a company, hacking into a company. Everybody is being attacked. Every business is being attacked from a cyber perspective every single day. And, you know, we're all working hard to improve, you know, the technology and the mitigation we have to fend off the attacks. But there isn't a business that's not getting attacked, you know, constantly. It's, 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 it's a real, real issue. That's different. I think from what you were talking about with cyber risk, where you talk about you know real cyber risk against our infrastructure, our systems, and so I just want to highlight that the two right. are the two are very very different things. Very different. Yeah. yeah. Talking about infrastructure. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of young people in the audience, students, maybe some who are graduating soon. I'm going to talk about talent and how you think about talent. How are you attracting talent when you're you're going up against big tech companies now for talent? Um, how do you think about that? Well, I. I um, I think we're in a very fortunate position that, um, that we offer a good value proposition for young people coming out of school to come, get some training, get some experience, work with a lot of super terrific, smart, interesting people, meet people, build a network, and start to develop some skills that, that you know, can expand your options and your opportunity. And so you know, we, we are certainly competing. The world's much more transparent. We're certainly competing with a lot of different companies in a lot of different spaces, but we continue to work hard at making sure that we're a very, very desirable place for people to come work you know, out of school and start their careers. And then it's our job to invest in those people, train them, develop them, retain them, give them opportunities so they stay. And we have a, you know, we have a pretty good ecosystem of people come, they get experience, they go off and do other things, but they feel they had a good experience in the firm. And we keep a small percentage of them that build, you know, build careers you know, at, the, uh, at the organization. But we don't, we don't take that position for granted at all. Um, we work hard and invest in it broadly. We use technology to make sure that we're recruiting, you know, broadly across schools around the world. And in particular, we're using technology to improve the diversity of the people that we're able to hire because we're extremely focused on the fact that we want to continue to improve the diversity of our workforce and continue to make the workforce extremely diverse and extremely inclusive. And so technology has given us better access to a much broader funnel of places that we can recruit, which in the past, you know, we were more limited. How do you think about talent? What sort of advice would you give to the young folks here? Um, I would say a couple things. Uh, huge believer in know thyself, right, and understand what environments you feel good and comfortable in and your highest and best self. So if you feel like, look, I, I'm risk averse, I want to be at a big company, I want to be a part of something like that, great, that's, that's fine. If you realize that I want to be entrepreneurial or I want to be at a smaller environment uh, where I feel impactful or, or whatever it might be, it's extraordinarily important to be reflective about that so that you know, you're putting yourself in the right position. And then I think, especially coming from a place like this, is understanding really what you stand for, what's important to you. Um, and I've told people, you know, that I know that are young and looking for advice, there's certain folks I've run into that said, look, I just want to make money. That's it. That's what I want to do. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure that's the best philosophy, but if that's in your heart, if that's what it is, then I guess shake hands with that. Um, but I think it's, especially in this day and age, to really understand yourself as best you can and to try to take a path in life that's not for your parents or not for your friends or whatever, but what you think is fulfilling. And I, I, if you can do that, I think you're, you're way ahead of where I was, that's for sure. You started as an entrepreneur right after graduation, is that correct? Pretty, pretty early. Yeah, how did, I'm curious, what was your story? How did you do that? How did I do that? Uh, a lack of people wanting to hire me? I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I always, uh, you know, just enjoyed having my own businesses. Well, so I, tell, people, tell people what you did when yeah. you started. What was the first business that you bought? I mean, good, well, I had, so. I had uh, an auto repair center, and my, my uh, David Costello, who drove up here from upstate New York, was in business with me both in our laundromat chain, Smart Wash, and, uh, and then our Jackson Hewitt uh, tax and accounting thing that we rolled up, which was, was kind of cool for that age. But um, I just always wanted to 
have my own business. And if I was going to screw up and drive over the cliff, I figured I'd rather at least, you know, be in the driver's seat. And then what was the path to legendary for you? Because that's really interesting, too. You went yeah. from that to Hollywood to making some of our favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and from there, I, I was at a tech uh, venture fund. But essentially, this is probably 2003, I was fascinated. Uh, the, the movie business at the time was a $30 billion industry. Uh, with a uh, unique capital structure. So you could buy public stocks, but there wasn't a lot of private equity, institutional capital, et cetera, et cetera that was adjacent uh, to the business. So I thought, that's a huge category not to have that. And could I build a company that sat next to the Hollywood ecosystem using their distribution system, you know, hopefully having world class content and so forth? And um, so we were. You know, I was able to put that together. Met a young director named Christopher Nolan, who turned out was pretty good. <laughs> um, and our first movie was Batman Begins, and you know, it worked out pretty well. It certainly did. David, we were talking earlier. You were camp counselor during your summers at Hamilton. If you could go back to the 1980s again, or actually no, if you were a student today. Would you still be a camp counselor and maybe still go to Wall Street? Would that still be attainable? Uh, or would you have to intern in order to make it now? I, you know, I, I, um, I'd certainly like to go back and be a camp counselor again. Those I, good uh, days. <laughs> I, 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 I love that. Uh, and something I'm still, you know, still passionate about. But um, look, I think that, I think unfortunately, there's good and bad out of this, but I think unfortunately the way society has evolved around you know, internships you know, in these years when you're in college as a path, a lot of hiring is done based on, you know, permanent hiring is done based on what you do the summer between your junior and senior year. And you know, I see the benefit of both for the student having an opportunity to experience an organization and say, hey, how does this feel to me? And for the organization to experience a student and say, hey, how does this feel to us? And there's a lot of real benefit to that. But, um, but I'm not sure for the students that the, the trade-off of that in the overall scheme of life is, is really worth it. And so, you know, I, I look, you know, we hire a summer class um, and, you know, the percentage of those people who work for us for the summer that get full-time offers, depending on the part of the firm, is between 75 and 90 percent, depending on what part of the firm it is. So generally, if you get an offer to spend the summer, you have a very good chance of getting an offer to have a permanent job. What that tells me is that our interview selection process is, for the summers, is pretty good, and it would be just as good if we were interviewing people when they were seniors. For the people, they do get insight into what it's like to be in the organization, but I think their life would be more enriching if they could take those summers between years in college and really pursue things that are passionate for them they can make them more well-rounded, more experiential, and then you know, they can go pursue something professionally. The problem is we couldn't go back to that because the whole world's kind of evolved to that. So just, just personally, I think that if I'm giving advice, when you enter college after your freshman year and your sophomore year, go do something that you're really passionate about the experience, that it'll broaden you. And then the summer after your junior year, before your senior year, go do something that's focused on how I want to get my first job. And so I don't know that, that we're better for that evolution, but I think that's the reality of the evolution that's occurred. And what's the one skill set that's the hardest to hire for right now? It's the hardest to hire for. It's the hardest to hire. That's an interesting question. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one that, that we're finding less and less, you know, inside the firm that I think is an important skill set, but actually we find it from students that come from Hamilton or other liberal arts backgrounds, is an ability to write. I, I, I might say finding folks who are looking for a, a longer term employment versus being transient, uh, because especially in what we yeah. do, you know, we, we, we put an awful lot into labs and so forth, and so if people are in and out, that's, that's harder to kind of build up knowledge set. Um, so I, I, would, I guess I'd say that. People are in a hurry. Everybody's in a hurry. <clears throat> and you know, I think that uh, when you think about a career, and to Thomas's point of a long-term time frame, I mean, it's, 
you know, for some it works to be in a hurry to be more transient and do different things, but there's a real benefit to being a little bit patient, a little more committed to things. You can always make changes and it's a long, you know, winding road in a career. Um, but I, I got some great advice from my grandmother a long time ago, which was don't be in a hurry. And I, I, I really think it's, it's, it's good advice. It's just good advice. Uh, and same Spider-Man's great advice, your grandmother's great advice. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people are in a hurry? Does this have anything to do with social media? Are we seeing our friends like, doing this and that? Or what's I, going I, on? I, I'm not good at it. I mean, I speculate about this. You and I were talking earlier about this. I, I will observe the world is just much more transparent. I, you know, I see it in my own experience. I left Hamilton College with a group of 15 to 20 very close friends. A handful of them wound up in, in New York. I would obviously see them on Friday nights. But the others, I had no idea what they were doing except for the handful of times a year that we made a concerted effort to get together someplace, whether it was coming back to a reunion up here on the hill or it was meeting somewhere else you know, around the country. But it was, it was very sporadic. I look through the eyes of my 27 and 24-year-old daughters today, and they have a much broader group of people that they went to school with, that they're in touch with, and they know everything about what they're experiencing. You know, not just big picture things like do they like their job or do they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but you know, how do they feel today? Did they get a raise today? Did they have a good day today? What did they have for dinner today? Um, today it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, you know, the ex it's, it's a very different, you know, experience, you know, experiential set because of the transparency that technology provides and these, these platforms really allow us to be in touch with and share experiences in a different way. And there's benefits of that in terms of staying in touch, you know, with a broader set of people, et cetera. But I, you know, I do think therefore everybody's looking through a lens of, well, what do I see everybody else doing and what am I doing? And I, I think that that, I think you could speculate that that could have an effect. I'm not sure I know, but I, I think you could speculate that that could have an effect. Yeah, you guys are both dads. What are you learning from your kids? What are they teaching you guys? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I have nine-year-old twin boys, and one of the things that kind of gives me hope, because there's a lot going on, I'm, I'm an optimist, but there's a lot of things going on in the world right now, um, is just they have such an inherent kindness. And, you know, there are times I'm in the middle of something that seems like, okay, this is a problem, like a real problem. Then one of them uh, will ask me, all kinds of questions, you know, including um, which dinosaur do I think would win in a fight or whatever, and they're very earnest about it. And there's times that I just look at them and I'm like, you know what, 95% of the stuff that we struggle through every day, it doesn't mean there aren't real problems, it doesn't mean that we, we don't want to successfully run our businesses, but I think since the theme today is technology, you know, I try to have good you know, cell phone hygiene and, and really try to turn off and, and I hate to use the word present because it's over, but they're present constantly at nine. They're in it. Everything is fascinating. And I, I find that pretty refreshing and I like it. It's good. I, I mean, I, I, I'm very grateful for my two daughters. I mean, more grateful for them than for anything else, um, you know, in the world. But if I, you know, I step back, there are lots of things that I experience, you know, through their eyes, and I learn and I see. But the thing I think that's been most interesting and relevant, maybe from a professional perspective, is there are two young women making their way out in the world, and they've they've really had an impact in the last five years in shifting my perspective on really understanding, you know, the experience of a young woman professional, you know, out in the world versus my experience as a white male, and they've they've. They've really had an impact in, you know, shifting my views and the importance of what we all have to do in leaders, you know, for, for everyone and making sure that work environments are open, inclusive, diverse, accepting. And it's very, very hard with our own inherent built-in biases to really see what's going on unless you're really open, you know, to listening and understanding. And it's, you know, your kids can make you you know, really listen and see and hear in a way that's different than people that are just colleagues. Those are two powerful insights from both of your kids. Uh, one final thing before we open up to questions. We, if you all could go back, if you could go back to 1992, you go back to 1984, what's the one thing you would do differently during your time at Hamilton? 
I would have studied music and become a professional DJ. Yes, <laughs> DJ Beatrice. <laughs> Um, I, I think I, I, I felt like I hurried through this, this place and, and because it was, I had to work at the time and all, all the different things and so I would have maybe taken a little more time to soak things in and understand what a special time it was versus, okay, I'm at college, I'm okay, this is the step because I'm gonna do this. I think I, I, if I could teleport back and talk to myself, I'd say, that'll all sort out. Be, be where your feet are and soak this in. That's, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting insight on a more serious note. I, boy, I'd love to go back and be a student again. It's not that I was a bad student and I certainly, you know, did fine academically and focused on it, but I didn't, I didn't take advantage of all that I could have been exposed to and all that was available to me um, while I was here. And I'd certainly have a different perspective on all that as a 57-year-old than I did as an 18 to 22-year-old. <laughs> take advantage of the opportunities. All right, we can open it up to questions. Maybe take four or five questions. You just raise your hand, there's a microphone. I can't see him. Yeah, I, I was going to say. Turn the lights off. Is it on? Hello? Oh, hi. <laughs> First of all, um, thank you so much. Uh, for being here, for speaking, for sharing your ideas and experiences, and also for donating back to Hamilton, because that's huge. Um, so thank you. Um, and I guess um, what I want to bring up is that one of the educational goals for Hamilton is for us to learn how to become um, informed, ethical, and engaged citizens. And so, especially since you guys both work in, um, and also you three, uh, work in the finance sector, which can has the capacity to be amoral, how do you work against that? How do you stay ethical in your work, um, in your work specifically, not outside your work, but in your work? Um, and how, do you, can, how can you prompt us to do the same? I, start? I, I would say uh, any sector can, can be amoral. Uh, so, you know, I came, I spent 13 years in Hollywood, so. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's not, certainly not just finance, but I, I think it's all about, again, your, your own compass. And I think, um, for me personally, what's, what's important, we're all human beings, we're gonna make mistakes, right? People are gonna make mistakes. You have to learn from those mistakes, you have to own those mistakes. And I think you have to constantly evaluate what it is that you stand for. And if you're faced with a situation as a company or, or you, you ask about business, so within business and saying, well, this is a situation I think we could probably do very well, advance our cause, make a lot of money, whatever it is, but this is kind of icky. I'm not sure we should be doing this. Then those alarm bells need to go off. Uh, I'm not sure you can really legislate that because at the end of the day, companies are a collection of people that you know have a, have a symbol and a set of business cards, and it's what the decisions that you make uh, every single day. So I think, I think it's great that at this age you're asking those questions um, and, and thinking about them, but it's something you gotta take inventory of all the time. Most, you know, most, most companies uh, really work hard to do the right thing and have integrity in their organizations and stand for things that matter but because most companies are big organizations with lots of people, as I said before, it only takes you know, one person to affect the reputation of a company. So you know, I, I do think one of the things that's important to, you know, to recognize in all this as leaders, we all have to stand up and talk about why integrity, trust, these things really matter in businesses. But we also have to accept that as things go wrong, it doesn't mean that the businesses as a whole or the industries as a whole are immoral. And, what we have to recognize is that generally most companies are working really hard to do well. When they don't, you know, they and the individuals involved have to be held accountable. But 
all of us are trying to do the right thing. We're trying to do the right thing for not just our shareholders, but for our people, for the communities that we work in. We try to find ways to give back and support the communities that we're involved in, and at the end of the day, you know, participate in the society that we're all lucky to be a part of. Um, and so I, I don't think it's hard for any of us to have our moral compass in the right place. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's complicated to run big businesses and not everybody gets it right. The question, oh, there are a couple. So I, of, so. I actually have a question for Thomas, and this is from your classmate, Julie Saslow, who's watching you online. And she said she, she actually has lots of stories about 3AM and Carnegie and prank phone calls. But her, <laughs> she's a high school teacher now. So she has a real job. That's yes. fantastic. <laughs> and her question to you is, how can I best serve a young you? that kid who can make anything happen, but might not yet trust him or herself? Um, look, I, I would say that reaching out to a student that maybe grew up the way I did in the circumstances that I did, and you know, reaffirming to he or she that, hey, you do have some ability, you're not, we don't live in a caste system, right? You, as long as you do the right things, this, this country largely is a meritocracy. And I think just letting you know, that, that person know that truly anything is possible and there's no governor on it, um, I, I, that's, that's the best I can give. And uh, I think that's tremendous that, that she's a teacher because I look at policemen, firemen, teachers as the backbone of this country and um, I'm sure she's doing it for the pay, but other than that, I think it's great. There's a, somebody right here, I don't know if I can. Um, you've both mentioned putting a premium on the value of like culture in the workplace, and so I wanted to ask how you personally uphold grit and resilience um, in your own lives, and then also how you engender that in the workplace. I'll go first. You, um, you know, in, 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 in terms of um, in terms of grit and resilience, personally, you know, I I, don't, I, I get up every day, <laughs> I put my uniform on, and I go to work, and I try to do the best that I can. You know, we um, you know we said before that you know life throws you lots of curveballs, both professionally and personally. And um, I think we've all got to figure out how to, how to navigate that. Um, somehow I've popped out the other end after 35 years, having navigated a lot and feeling okay, but I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. And I just know that I'm going to do the best that I can do. And I go home every night uh, kind of feeling like, you know, I left it on the field and I'll do the best that I can do. You know, more importantly, you know, in our organization, we, we talk a lot you know, about culture and the importance of culture. One of the things I'm learning as I've moved up to the organization, I'm now in a, the position where I'm leading the organization, is leadership starts at the top, and when you want, you know, the culture to move, or you want the culture to evolve, or you want to reinforce things in the culture, you have to say them, talk about, you have to, you have to act them, you have to lead with them, you've got to lead from the front, you've got to say it and talk about it over and over and over again. And just when you feel that you have said it so many times that you can't say it again, you might be at the point where the organization's hearing you, and then you've got to say it another time. And so, you know, these, these things, you know, organizations like big aircraft carriers, and they move, you know, they, they're, they're moving quickly, but to change the direction, you know, takes a lot. And so you've got to really make sure the cultural pillars of the organization, the foundation of what you want to stand for, you've got to believe they're deeply rooted. And when you feel like you need to move them or change them, you've got to invest a lot of your energy you know, from a leadership perspective in, in trying to do that. Yeah, and I think David obviously has very different uh, problem sets. When you're running Goldman Sachs, which has how many employees? A little less than 40,000. Yeah, so that, that's, that organization, I think that's, the, the fundamentals I think are the same, but how you uh, make manifest of that I, I think is a different thing. For me, you know, Legendary turned into a relatively sizable company, might have made the other income line for, for Goldman, but uh, we had, I think, at our height, 350 employees or so, 
And I think some of those things that you asked about, there was a lot more proximity to me. So the interactions I had with my management team, getting up in front of the company and talking, being transparent, telling the company why we were taking the strategic directions that we were, and the way that you treat the people that work there sets the tone. If you act entitled or above it all and everything, I think that, you know, that, that will take hold. Um, and at Tolco, where we're, our, the companies we own have a lot of employees, but, but we don't, uh, I think all those things that, uh, that David mentioned and that, that we've talked about here tonight, you, you, you can't just talk about them, you have to, you have to live them. And I th also think that in times of crisis or problems, you know, you can't what I call turtle, right? You can't kind of go into a crouch. You, you, those are the moments, even if inside you're saying like, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. You know, you have to regroup, you have to come back with, uh, with a plan and you have to look people in the eye and, um, you know, and be accountable for those decisions that you make. But it, it's something I think uh, is earned every single day. And one of the things that I used to say all the time well, in, bo in both companies is, you know, I, I'm, always, I'm always impressed and strive to do the right things and work hard and, and do the extra things when nobody's looking, when it's not celebrated, when it's not, no one maybe knows it but you and a handful of people. So th those are some of the things that you try to instill. I have a question that, uh, thank you for being here. But when you look in the room here, you see disproportionate to America if it's 50-50 male-female. The room has many more males than females. If you look and you see the demographics of, again, of America, you don't see the shadings of what usually America, I mean, of, of the demographics of America. And so I ask, what you would have um, said or done to elementary schools, to middle schools, to high schools, to have made the gathering, because it's all on desire for people to come. I mean, there was no other reason. So it somehow is more desirable, if you take this as a, as a, as a measure, more desirable to male population than to female and or of color. And it has later ramifications because I'm older and I never thought about financial securities in, so if you're not doing it when you're young and you're even thinking of that as a component, then it has long, 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 long terms, not just you know the glass ceilings. So what would you do to have advertised or, you know, it doesn't mean true advertising, but made it so that it was attractive to all, um, to, to genders and races earlier so that it doesn't get to this or until you're 50 and it's all, you know, old white people that have, you know, um, have made it because it's been interesting, not because it was really, dis there was a disparate difference of actual monies. So that's my question. Well, I, 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 um, I'd start by saying that, that I think that, uh, that diversity and inclusion in our society uh, has a long way to go. Um, and while there is an effort and an investment that's being made um, by government in a variety of ways, by businesses in a variety of ways, by community in a variety of ways, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, it's, it's hard for me to look out, I, I, because of the lights, um, it's hard for me to look out at the room, but your point about you know, this community and the diversity in this community, from sitting on the board, I'm a little bit familiar, but not steeped in the facts the way the way others that are here are, but this community has come a long way in the last decade in the context of the diversity of the student body, the diversity of the faculty, the diversity of the community on the Hill here, but we've talked a lot on the board about how we still have more work to do, and more work to do on the representation on the board, and more work to do in continuing to advance the, 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 the nature of the diversity and the inclusive environment that we have here on the Hill. 
I think it's no different in businesses. It's, 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 there's progress to be noted. You can look at things that we're seeing that I think are indicative of the progress, but it's one of the reasons why I, as a leader at Goldman Sachs, continue to talk about it because I still feel we've got a long way to go. And I feel we have to find practical solutions, and we're trying to do that in our business to make our small contribution. But I don't have a clear societal answer. Uh, but I know I'm going to do what I can as a leader in my organization, as a participant on the board up here, to make a con contribution toward moving it forward. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that, and I would just thank you for coming, because at the end of the day, you, you decided to come and see what this is all about. So I appreciate that you're here, and um, you know, so thank you. Julia, this is going to be our last question. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so in the wake of the, the Me Too movement and sort of your discussion about your daughter and with your son and a rise in the discussion about women's rights in general, what practical measures would you recommend taking as, as a company, as a financial institution, or as any sort of institution to help achieve true gender equality in terms of opportunity and pay, and also how we can best, as a society, empower women to pursue careers in traditionally male-dominated spaces. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think um, there's a lot of light on this appropriately right now, and I think it is a, it's a work in progress. I would certainly love to see and I'm involved in some things trying to um, give more opportunities to women in technology um, and I, I think it's uh, it's an effort that uh, you know that we all have to undertake our company takes this very very seriously again we're smaller so it's easier to easier to be um, you know have have impact and effect but I think it also starts with our attitudes and not to put uh, parameters around anything and to say to men and women look if, if you're if you're hungry and you're you're willing to work and you know you're intellectually curious and all those other things there's no rules you should be able to do anything and you should be compensated the same way and uh, and I think it's a I'm glad that you raised it you know I'd, I'd, I'd simply add that uh, that Goldman Sachs has been for a long time focused on advancing the diversity and the inclusive nature of the organization. When I became a CEO six months ago, I really started talking about it, you know, even more aggressively because I think it's something that's hugely important for us as a business priority, but also because I just think it's right. To do that, you've got to work at it in a very, very concrete and specific way. And so we've put a number of initiatives into place that we think are very specific to change our hiring practices and really move the needle. A couple of years ago, we specifically said that our entry level hiring had to get to 50% women within a few years. It had to get to 11% black here in the United States, 14% Hispanic. Those numbers were based on the available workforce that we were recruiting out of. And we've made a lot of progress in just a year and a half, two years, on moving towards those goals from where we are. Um, but we still continue to focus on it, because across the organization, it's not where we want to be. But what I believe my job as a leader is to find ways to continue to shift the culture in the organization, both to make real improvement in what the organization look like, looks like, but also how it feels and what the nature of inclusiveness is across the organization. And so we're focused on it. We're going to continue to work at it. Please join me in thanking Thomas Tall and David Solomon. Thank you both. Thank you.